Um, before we actually um, start talking about redefining art, we need to actually define what art is. Um, what is art? Something that's really complicated. It's a complicated issue. Um, it can be very personal to all of us, um, and that's, that's, I think, a very important statement. Maybe we need to look at some people who are professionals, who work and have practiced most of their lives within the realm of art. Uh, what do they have to say? Um, let's see. Oscar Wilde, one of my favorite quotes here. Um, art is the most intense mode of individual individualism that we know in this world. Another good quote. Art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. It sounds beautiful, but what, what does it really mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me and us as a culture? Art is not what you see, but what you make others see. So that kind of talks like artists have a responsibility in the world, right? Um, art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. So it has a social action, a social quality. So we've, we've heard a lot of different quotes, a lot of information from these people who have spent their lives invested and emerged in art making. Let's hear from an art critic. Um, one of my favorite individuals, one of my heroes, my uh, muse, uh, Jerry Saltz. He actually um, failed as an artist. He, uh, he tried to work in the art world and just felt he couldn't do it. So what he wound up doing is uh, getting in a truck and driving a truck for a lot his life until when he was around 40, he started, maybe I should start writing about art. And he has a very beautiful way of breaking down and digesting some of these complexities of us trying to understand what the art world is all about. And this is something that he stated recently. Art is a self-replicating force. So it sounds like art actually needs us to reproduce itself, correct? So again, very interesting. Almost sounds like a virus in a way, doesn't it? Um, sounds very artificial. So let's actually move over to what our friendly neighborhood artificial intelligence. What does it say? What does AI say about art? It also sounds almost a little more human than some of the other ones that we've heard. Art is a profound expression of us as humans. So let's just agree on that. It's a form of communication. In some cases, we're making up our own language. Um, art at its core has the power to evoke emotions, evoke feelings from us. And as we move on, we need to look at the instances where art was first formed. So this is called the hashtag. Um, it's a, a piece of work that was created over 73,000 years ago. Um, and again, we'll come back to the hashtag, but it's interesting that this kind of launched our approaches to art um, at, as prehistoric creators. And again, we'll return to the importance of the hashtag as we move on. Later, about 43,000 years ago, um, artists started painting in caves. And technically, these aren't paint, uh, cave paintings. They're not paintings at all. They're actually more closer to street graffiti. Instead of using aerosol pans, uh, these artists are using their hands and other types of stencils, blowing pigment and powder with a bone, a hollow bone. And what's interesting, again, that's talking about what art is about. This is where it started. But at the same time, we only see about 1% of these, uh, these works of art that have existed. So 99% of them are no longer around. Then we started getting more complex. So we're talking about art as being a form of communication. It's, we're kind of starting to create narratives. We're creating stories, right? So we're also creating very complex symbols to represent things. What, what's been determined is that we're trying to represent invisible forces, things that we don't know, things that we can't see with our eyes, things that we feel. And as we move on, these symbols get more complex. And then we start even getting tighter with these storylines, becoming more narrative, talking about our heroes, the heroes that are inside of us, um, the things that we worship that we don't see, getting very complex, talking about you know, Egyptian hieroglyphs, all the way dealing with the ideas of our modern mythologies. Um, Jerry Saltz also states that we're still using the very same operating system we did in the caves. We've just changed our technology. We have new tools. We have new approaches, new devices that we can utilize to express ourselves. 
And in this case, also Joseph Campbell talking about um, the hero's journey, the, um, the myth cycle. And that's also shared among different cultures throughout the time periods. We've just changed the operating system a little bit. And then the, the artists themselves become heroes. Not only telling the stories of the hero and being themselves, but also the, their heroic journeys. Um, in, in ancient tribes, many of the shamans or leaders of the tribes are actually are the artists of the tribe as well, and the storytellers. So it kind of goes hand in hand. So let's do a little bit of a crash course in art history. And um, again, I'm kind of curating it to the areas that I think are, are most important and most important to me, and I think most important to you. But we're also dealing with times that art is a snapshot of what's happened around the world. So let's we'll start with World War I. What came out of this was actually Dada, or Dadaism. So dealing with the notions of the absurdity of our brutality to one another. Um, thinking about how do we represent the world around us when we've just committed all these atrocities to one another. How do we kind of think about art and how does art well, really now represents us as a soul. Then World War II, what came out of this was abstraction. So why do we even draw anything that's real around us now? Let's only express ourselves. Let's express our identities, our passions. Going back to those things that we don't see. Then the Vietnam War. For uh, Western cultures, this actually led to our contemporary art movement. So dealing with conceptual art, why even make something? Let's just have it as an idea. Maybe it's a performance art piece. Maybe it's something that just captures time. Something that you have to document in order to show proof that it even existed. And also dealing with um, anti-commodification. These artists didn't want to sell their work in galleries. They wanted just their ideas to be expressed to everybody. It wasn't a status symbol to have their art. What it was was their sharing ideas. And then COVID. What happened there? Yeah, we kind of don't know. But what did happen, as far as the major art movements that's going on right now, we're talking about super immersed in technology, but we also returned back to the cave, didn't we? We isolated ourselves. So returning to a point where, again, art was redefined. If I grab something, place it in a museum, is it art? If I say it's art, it's art. That's where we're going with Marcel Duchamp and his fountain in 1917. And his ready-mates, these objects that he brought into a gallery space. But he didn't do it by himself. He also had a gallerist. He had somebody who owned the gallery that was helping him. But then we also get into other involved. Art is not about itself, but the attention we bring to it. So what are we talking about? For all in all, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world. That's basically the audience. That's you guys. You guys going to a gallery, a museum, that work basically doesn't exist without you seeing it. If it's ignored, it's really not art anymore, right? And then getting into what we do deal with galleries and museums. Does the value of that art make it more important than other parts, other art forms? So Banksy, um, again, going back to the idea of graffiti art, and um, he was thinking, again, about anti-commodification. His work went into an auction house, uh, Sotheby's, and this was actually selling for 4,300,000 USD, okay? Um, so basically a stencil spray paint, it's called um, Little Girl with Red Balloon. And he wanted to create something, again, that dealt against the commodification of his work. And during this time period, what he did is he created a frame that destroyed this work. So, and all the people who were actually, it had been sold, right when it destroyed itself, it was sold. So, um, everybody was really having a hard time with understanding what had happened. They, people who bought it were in shock after all that money that they had spent. But then what happened, there was a reaction against this. So, actually, because of this, this was actually the first art piece in an auction house that was made in an auction house. The fact that it destroyed itself, it didn't become less valuable, it became a lot more valuable. 
We're talking 2.5 million USD dollars after it was destroyed. And the title was changed to Love in a Bin. And again, my, one of my favorite works is um, this artist who had um, a retrospect at what, an early age um, at the Guggenheim in New York, a solo exhibition, uh, retrospecting his entire career as an artist. This banana was originally going to be a bronze cast sculpture. And he decided that it was going to be a reaction against the commodification against art again. It was a speaking against the art world and talking about the vanity and the status related to it. At the same time during the opening, this got destroyed. Another performance art came, artist came in and ate it. And this was a $120,000 banana. So did art just die? Was that the moment that art died? So my friends were actually really mad at me. And I was like, well, I didn't make this. This was at Art Faisal. I, don't, I can't even afford to get in the door at that place. So again, what happened here? But it died for a little bit, but then it came back. It came back because of social media. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to have be taken, have selfies next to this banana. And it became one of the most popular items on the internet. And then we returned back to the hashtag. Everybody was hashtagging the comedian or banana, $120,000 banana. So again, this took off and people became almost celebrities next to this banana taped to a wall. So again, we returned again to the cave, but this cave became gigantic. Every cut, everybody could see what was inside this cave. Your social media wall became your cave. And then we had the birth of artificial intelligence. Algorithms trying to read what you might want to buy. Algorithms trying to kind of feel out what you're researching online all the time. And then AI kill art? Is this the death of art now? Um, is this the death of creativity? Or is this just another tool for us to use to explore areas we never thought we could possibly explore? One of my favorite movies is Blade Runner. Um, and again, it's about artificial intelligence. And one of my favorite lines is the very, one of the last lines. But this would not exist without the actor who played Roy, the android. If he wasn't, um, he actually ad-libbed. He came up with some of these lines. Right now in Hollywood, if you're an actor and you come up with your own lines, you cannot do that anymore. So this is, again, it's not the tools, it's not the technology that's interfering with our creativity. It's us putting a sensor on the creativity that, of ourselves. So it's really interesting. It's kind of a double-edged sword right now. And this is just by coincidence, but this is from one of my past students, Roy Lamore, who is actually at Rhode Island School of Design in US. And he's working closely with MIT in a think tank what he was trying to do with this, and this is actually a very long video that documents uh, an electronic process of him trying to take his creative soul and actually transport it into another AI. So he's trying to take all the things that make him unique, and what this is doing is searching all his WeChat information, it's searching anything that he writes, his emails, his calls, everything. So it's pulling every bit of information that he's ever talked about. Uh, and actually reproducing a creative outlet. So it's kind of an interesting, actually kind of scary process. It's like it's stealing your soul in a way. But you know, again, art keeps on dying and keeps on coming back to life, right? Especially painting. Especially painting. I, always, I like to make fun of this because painting dies and is reborn again and again. When the printing press came out, uh, painters thought their livelihood was going to be gone. Because now you didn't have to go to a gallery to see our work. You could buy it for $5 versus $500. And then the, top, the camera came out. The camera destroyed the printing press in a way. And then is painting dead again? Do we need to reproduce the things that can be done in a second? Again, just a tool. And then Andy Warhol single-handedly almost destroyed abstract expressionism. 
uh, and destroying almost contemporary art by just doing this commercial and eating a Whopper. And then Superman died. But then Superman came back, right? So again, we're in a really interesting place. And this is just a little bit of a table showing when art has died from 2009 to 2013. So again, it just keeps on dying and coming back again, according to galleries, according to museums. It's not going anywhere. My favorite hero, artist, Joseph Boys. Everyone is an artist. And I firmly believe that. Every one of you are artists. And uh, before I came into the talk today, I actually found this. There's an AI group using Joseph Boyd and using his tagline, every, ma every man is an artist, because they're not actually having their hands on the work. They're actually having, again, AI create this. But they're creating Joseph Boyd's. I just think that is utterly fascinating. And then one of my other favorite lines, to be a teacher, is my greatest work of art. And again, for me, this is a very personal experience. And um, I think for all of you, making something is your personal experience. This is how you be an artist. When you make something, does it look really bad? Does it look really good? Okay, you're an artist. Make some more, right? You all look good too, make some more art. And for me, I get to do this every day. How cool is that, huh? Thank you.